Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Rick Earls, and I'm the Senior Director of Industry and Innovation for Team Neal, and I will be your moderator today. So welcome to today's webinar entitled Visualize Real-Time Data. Uh, this webinar is the third in a series of five webinars that describes the steps necessary to implement data-driven manufacturing, uh, the journey we call it. Um, DDM, you know, data-driven manufacturing, is an emerging technology that when embraced by manufacturers has proven to greatly increase the business performance and efficiency of those manufacturers. So <clears throat> before we get started on the presentation, I'd like to um, do a little housekeeping first. So um, I wanna make sure that everybody knows that they can submit a question today. Um, the instructions are there on the first page. Again, there's a there is a there is an, <clears throat> a button on the side of your page then, and all that information will be displayed in front of me, and we'll we'll put them up for answers at the end of the presentation. Also, you need to know that this presentation is being recorded today, and so you should receive a link within about 24 hours that will give you. A, access to that recording plus access to the presentation materials themselves and also the additional resources that you can rely on to do further investigation to the subject area. So with that said, let's let's move on to the next. Kurt. I would like to introduce you to Jay Ferran, Team Neal's uh, Senior Vice President and the Industry and Innovation Group who among his many functions is responsible for the oversight of the smart manufacturing cluster of Northeast Ohio. Uh, Jay will give us a quick overview of the smart manufacturing cluster uh, of Northeast Ohio and then provide a high level description of the webinar series, how to start your journey to data-driven manufacturing. So Jay, take it away, please. Thank you, Rick. Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here. Um, uh, this production, uh, this webinar series, and this specific webinar are a production of the Smart Manufacturing Cluster of Northeast Ohio. We know you have a lot of choices of webinars to attend and events to go to. Um, we're glad you're, you're spending time with us. Let me just take a quick moment to tell you a little bit about the Smart Manufacturing Cluster of Northeast Ohio. Its purpose uh, really is to accelerate the growth and competitiveness of the Northeast Ohio economy through the implementation of industrial IoT. Uh, and uh, we want to do that because we want to leverage the rich manufacturing heritage that we enjoy here in Northeast Ohio. We have over 7,000 manufacturing facilities in Northeast Ohio. Simply amazing and impressive. Uh, what do the cluster really attempts to do is to connect I IoT knowledge, experience, tools, and networks with manufacturers so that we can generate more demand, increase productivity, spur product innovation, and develop the talent and resources necessary to drive IIoT implementation and innovation. The Smart Manufacturing Cluster, uh, if you wanna learn more about it, you can go to the smartmanufacturingcluster.org website. Well, there you're gonna find a, a number of different tools which include, first of all, a roadmap, a commercialization roadmap to take, uh, help you with your journey. Secondly, a readiness assessment to give you a sense of where you might be on your journey. Uh, a use case database, whereby you can uh, look uh, across a variety of different applications uh, by size of company and by industry and get a good, good sense of what might be possible in, smart manu in applying smart manufacturing. Uh, so we hope you'll uh, continue to be involved in the smart manufacturing cluster. Uh, it's made up of manufacturers, critical to the whole uh, concept, uh, solution providers, academia, incubators, investors, et cetera. All again, with the intent of accelerating the rate of adoption and making sure that the, it is successful. Okay, so the webinar series is another thing that the uh, cluster uh, has produced, and it's a series. We're in number three, visualize. What makes this webinar, I think, valuable 
is that it brings together a manufacturer and a solution provider into a single webinar. Um, and you know, we're really focusing on operational excellence, improved efficiency, and profitability of small and medium-sized manufacturers. Also, because of COVID-19, uh, we are uh, speaking to the various uh, impacts of COVID-19 and how smart manufacturing can be a potential solution. So with that, let me turn it back to Rick. Thank you again for being here and thank you for being involved with the smart manufacturing cluster of Northeast Ohio. Thank you, Jane. Let me uh, spend a little bit more time. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Yeah, let me spend a little bit more time here just to uh, lay the foundation of how we got to this point. So we've already had a number of presentations that uh, are part of the steps associated with the journey. Um, we've already had the prepare webinar. We've had the connect webinar. And now today we'll have them visualized. So um, what is really important is the prepare is a step that we, we see a lot of organizations don't address very well, but in fact, it lays it lays the groundwork to ensure that your journey, in fact, is going to be successful. R really what it does is allow the organization to come up to speed on some of the general concepts, not the really detailed concepts, but the understanding of an establishment of expectations for what DDM can do for the organizations. And then take that, translate that into a plan, and in fact, also find a solution provider that can help you with that journey. So that was done in one, and described in one. Two is now connect. So that's frankly, steps two, three, four, and five are the implementation of that plan that's created in, in the first step. And of course, the first part being, let's, let's find all the critical data, let's start collecting it, bring it into some media that allows us to then take it and use it for the steps you know, three, four, and five. And of course, now visualize, you're gonna see this for the first time today, as to uh, how to start, how to start um, um, using that data to actually improve business performance and efficiency. In other words, how to start harvesting the value from that data that's been collected. So, and then you'll also hear today because of the unique format we're using here um, that uh, Kurt, for example, is representing the manufacturer. And it's actually very unique in this situation because Rockwell is not only the solution provider, but they're also acting as the manufacturer. And in that instance, you'll actually hear Kurt describe not only these steps on how he prepared, but also what they did for connection, or what they did for visualization, and, and what it, even in fact the analysis and some of the optimization that they've done. So he'll present a, a work, he'll, he'll be presenting a use case first, and then we'll dive more in detail as to what's necessary to make visualization effective. All right, next, next slide. So you're gonna be hearing a little bit more about, again, uh, real-time data and all the levels of the operations that, are that need to have insight to this data. That's the basis of what Visualize is all about. So again, um, things like can visual, well, we wanna present that, uh, I'll show you how easy it is, for example, that there are a number of existing packages and soft, both software and hardware packages out there today that allow you to implement, uh, again, that, uh, that ability to take that data, visualize it, and actually use it, utilize it back in the operations. Um, how do you automate the collection of real-time data? And then we'll even, uh, if it's not in the main in the main presentation, we'll be talking about it even in the question areas using AR and VR to enhance productivity and operational support. All right, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I'm going to I want to introduce here's the Here's the agenda for today's activity. So I'm going to quickly introduce both Kurt and Dave. Then uh, Kurt does, I'm sorry. Yeah, Kurt's going to start off and Dave is actually going to help uh, talk about the manufacturer's use case and then how that uh, uh, drills down to visualization of data and the role that then plays. Um, and then you'll actually even throughout the presentation hear how that visualization has been implemented through, again, software and hardware concepts. And then at the end, we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna have a question and answer session, and hopefully um, 
we'll be able to control our time requirements so that we have some time to spend in uh, addressing the questions you've submitted. And then we have a couple of questions we know that you're going to be interested in. So let's go back. So uh, Kurt, I wanted to introduce you, manufacturing systems engineer at Rockwell Automation in Twinsburg. Um, and of course, we all know that Rockwell is a manufacturer of industrial, at least at that location, it's a uh, manufacturer of industrial control products, such as programmable program logic controllers, you know, electronic operator interfaces, input output IO devices, and various distributed on machine products. And uh, Dave, of, of course, he's from Rockwell also. He's an account manager, and he's acting as a solution provider today. The products, uh, and he provides a you know, full stack of capabilities for industrial automation and information systems. And again, um, takes a lot of the information or a lot of the experience from what Kurt has um, uh, um, derived from the experience and helps turn that back into products that then is responsible for selling into the marketplace. So with that said, Kurt, you want to take over? Sure. And thank you for the, the intro there, Rick. Um, sure. So as we jump into the presentation here, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of, of who we are at Rockwell. For those who are unfamiliar, I will talk a little bit about our journey. You know, as Rick talked about the, the prepare and connect uh, phases of the model, and then we'll get into some specific use cases with how we've used data visualization and the connected enterprise at Rockwell Automation to improve productivity and our business metrics uh, throughout our enterprise. So in terms of our footprint in Northeast Ohio, uh, we've got a manufacturing uh, plant in Twinsburg, uh, which was opened in 1979. And we've got uh, just under 260,000 square foot of manufacturing uh, where we run 24 by seven. Uh, we've got about 300 folks on site uh, where we primarily focus on building our PLCs, our HMIs, um, our, our drives, and a few other um, what we'll call medium complexity products. So uh, as, as Rick mentioned, uh, I'm a systems engineer. I support our internal operations, specifically uh, in, in and around what we call the connected enterprise at, at Rockwell, um, where we're taking data from our manufacturing process, contextualizing it, process, processing it into useful information, all in the name of driving productivity, improving quality, uh, and improving metrics throughout the business. Uh, my customers you know, being internal facing are, are what you see here. So we, we my team uh, primarily interfaces with our manufacturing engineers, our supervisors, plant managers, uh, production control analysts, and so on and so forth uh, to provide data from our manufacturing process uh, to, to improve uh, our operations. Specifically in Twinsburg, uh, you know, with, with the products that I mentioned uh, previously, it all starts with printed circuit board assembly. Uh, so for those unfamiliar with this process, it, you're basically taking a, a raw circuit board and populating it with components, with chips, resistors, transistors, so on and so forth. And for us in, in Twinsburg, that's, that's a major uh, metric in terms of our productivity. Uh, and that's, that's a placement, which is depicted by the, the blue bar chart here. And what that means, a placement is anytime a machine takes a component and actually places it onto a circuit board. And what, and what we like to depict here with this, with this chart is our productivity, our placements has gone up year over year while we've been able to reduce our headcount through natural attrition. Um, and not because we're adding new equipment or buying new machines, simply because we're using what we have smarter and, and we're able to do that through the connectivity, through the visualization of data and making better uh, data-driven decisions. Um, and then just to, to brag a little bit on, on the folks in the plants, uh, uh, Plant Engineering Magazine actually recognized our, our Twinsburg facility in 2017 as a uh, top plant. Uh, through our use of Industry 4.0, Connected Enterprise, and some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Hey, Kurt, I just wanted to add on to there is that one of the things that which we look at is, is that we're a technology company. So for us, um, 
cost of the technology keeps driving down lower and lower, but our 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 unit volume hasn't kind of gone in the other direction with regards to dramatically growing the, as as much as the price is decreasing on there. So the only way that we're going to be able to be profitable is being able to drive out productivity at our plants through what Kurt's doing and his team's doing through there. So the visualization of that data and the processes that we're doing, that's really driving out productivity and profits back to the company. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. So when we talk about Rockwell Automation at a glance, you know, we are a, a larger manufacturer uh, with 18 plants globally. Uh, we've got almost 400,000 different SKUs in our inventory. Uh, but you know, to relate to folks here in Northeast Ohio, uh, we, we do face a lot of the, the, the same challenges as, as even small and, and medium-sized manufacturers. Uh, to, to put that in a context, when we talk about the orders that we receive, uh, we're very much a high mix, low volume environment where uh, any order that we receive can, can range to up to 200 different SKUs per order. So when we talk about things like changeovers, uh, and, you know, and, and, and maintaining different uh, recipes and, and bills of materials and things like that, you know, we, we absolutely can relate. And, and hopefully you'll see that here throughout the presentation. Um, so this, this slide is, is what I like to call our, our bottom line up front. So uh, when we talk about this connectivity, this use of data, you know, what it means to us is, is we're able to realize a 5% productivity improvement year over year. And the way we're able to do that is through the levers you see here on the slide. So by reducing our inventory on hand, um, having better visibility in the inventory so we have to keep less on the shelf and able to free up some of that working capital. Uh, CapEx avoidance. So the, the, the old way of doing things was if we needed to in, 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 in increase our capacity, we'd buy a new machine. Now we're able to challenge that, that school of thought a little bit better and really get a, a better picture of, of what our manufacturing environment looks like and make better use of the equipment we have. And, and overall, what that means is we've been able to spend less on CapEx and, and use what we've got and improve our productivity with the equipment we have. Then when we talk about some of our customer facing metrics in terms of our delivery on time, um, our lead times and, and our quality, uh, we've been able to realize improvements across the board there. Now, like, like everyone else though, it, it wasn't always pie in the sky for us. You know, we, we, we faced our, our share of uh, challenges getting to where we are today. And just to talk, uh, anecdotally about these, uh, you know, in, in the beginning for us, before we, we went on this journey, we really didn't have this uh, clear level of visibility into our manufacturing process. You know, I talked with engineers that started uh, with Rockwell in the early 90s, and, you know, an engineering project, um, you know, that might go on for a couple of months, an engineer would spend, you know, anywhere 40 to 50 percent of that time being a data clerk, collecting data from a manufacturing process, uh, going through spreadsheets and, and charts, trying to contextualize that data into a usable format, and really only spending about half that time being an actual engineer. You know, worse yet, uh, you know, I mentioned, you know, we have 18, 18 facilities globally. Several of these facilities uh, follow a very similar manufacturing process. But when you look from, from facility to facility, it, it was very difficult to, to compare best and, and identify best practices because we weren't working on the same sheet of music. You know, we'd have engineers in different groups arguing where the process started, where it ended, you know, what really defined a metric. Um, and it was very difficult to say, you know, one plant is doing it better than another and, and that needs to become the gold standard. And, you know, and then lastly, I, I think we've all seen this, the, the picture on the right there with push pin charts and printouts and things like that. Um, and, it, it's really difficult to make data-driven decisions off, off charts like this. You know, best case scenario, those, those graphs are printed off the morning of, more likely it's, it's on the Monday of that week. And I, I, I wouldn't be hard pressed to go up to one of these boards and find a chart from six months ago. And that's what our, that's what our leaders would be relying on to, to make decisions for the plants. So when we talk about real-time decisions, it, it was uh, darn near impossible. You know, since going forward with our connected enterprise journey, we've been able to uh, realize a clear uh, vision into our manufacturing process and, and capture real-time data and, and use that data to make 
uh, better decisions uh, in terms of manufacturing and in terms of uh, strategy and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, we'll dive into a little bit of, of how we went about doing that and, and some of the, the examples that we see. But, you know, first I want to talk a little bit about capturing data and collecting data. So, I've, I've been asked in the past, you know, do you just cast a wide net and, and take more of the like the Google and the Amazon approach collecting data and, and scouring that data to try to find correlations and, and that's the silver bullet, if you will. And the answer it really is no. In manufacturing, we still we still have engineers, we still have observations from our process, but we're able to to capture data in in, in smarter ways because there's a cost to that. And, and this is this is really that model. Uh, we, we call it the convergence of IT and OT. IT being our business systems like our ERP, our financials, our, our human resources, time and attendance, things like that, with our OT mean the, the smart equipment that we have on our shop floor, our sensors, our controllers, uh, conveyors, and things like that. And bringing that data together to contextualize it into a, a usable format that's able to uh, help us drive productivity. But but again, we're looking at the process. We have engineers who who know the process and, and know where we need to collect that data because it's, it's not as simple as throwing a cookie out there on, on a browser. It, it's installing a sensor or tapping into a controller. And again, there's a there's a, a cost to that. So uh, when we talk about the, the approach, it's, it's really not just collect all the data that you can, but you know, start with uh, your problem solving method and then collect the data, you know, in areas where you, where you feel that you need to. Again, it, it kind of, it, it boils down to what problem are you trying to solve? And, and that's always where we begin when we're, when we're going on this process. So if you take a look at in terms of how we, we typically got reports and data and things, if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, You'll see that you know a report would have been generated out of the plant floor, got some data, it goes up to quality. More reports are created on that side of the fence and more people do it. Gets up to the finance and the executive levels in terms of what decision, what products they need to buy, what resources they need to have. And that data then gets up and more reports are generated on there. And a lot of latency, as, as Kurt already talked about, there's a lot of latency issues. There's also a lot of, um, I'm not gonna say manipulated data, but I'm gonna say not, always the most accurate data may have gotten reflected going from the shop floor to the top floor. If you go to the at the right hand side, you're on the IIoT information infrastructure is as data is, becomes transparent. And as we talked to in the previous series about the importance of planning and, and communicating or connecting uh, data, um, now we're making that data available to everybody in a real time basis that's on there. So we get the right information to the right people at the right time. And, and if you see those little locks on there, you also want to make sure that it's that security is pervasive all the way from the top floor to the shop floor. And this allows us then to make quicker decisions, it allows us to then to make um, accurate predictions in terms of what we're doing, make changes that are on the fly based upon the loads that are coming in. And especially as you saw COVID-19 that, that hit us as well too, um, our ability to react and to redeploy if we need to. So you can see on the right-hand side, it's, it's really for getting that right information, right people, right time. And what that amounts to is is this before and after. So you know when we talk about before having you know connectivity, before having the, these this data driven system, um, a lot of paper processing, job packets being shuffled around on the shop floor. If the plant manager wanted to know where a hot order was, uh, they'd be calling on supervisors, production supervisors, team leads, and chasing down paper packets to where now we can click a button and see where any work order is in real time and, and seeing that for any of our plants in the world. Um, when we talk about our process optimization, uh, we, we weren't really making fully data-driven decisions to, to now uh, we have the data, we can reinforce it with the true cost to productivity when we're talking about a sub-optimized process and make, a, make true uh, capital uh, decisions uh, moving forward with that. So I want to dive into some of our, our use cases and, and how we've used data here at, at Rockwell. Um, but to, so to, to paint a little bit, a bit of the picture there, 
I mentioned in Swinsburg, we, we primarily focus on printed circuit board assembly. And uh, this is, is, is kind of a day in the life of, of our plant at Twinsburg with uh, some of the metrics that, that we perform to. So we have seven lines in Twinsburg that are producing circuit boards. And again, that's, that's populating those boards with different chips. And we're doing about uh, 1.3 million of those placements per day on about 10,000 boards. And uh, one of, the, one of the, the use cases that we saw in using data with printed circuit board assembly was part of that orchestration across plants and sharing best practices. So in printed circuit board assembly, anytime you have uh, the machine goes to grab a chip off of a reel and it fails to place that on the board, that's called a mispick. And we try to minimize the number of missed picks because it generally leads to scrap and inefficiencies in our process. So we have four plants in the world that do printed circuit board assembly and three of them uh, were seeing missed picks in the range of about 2000 to 3000 PPM. We had one plant in Wisconsin that was around 10,000 PPM. And uh, you know, through blood, sweat, and tears over the course of a year uh, and a lot of continuous improvement projects, they were able to reduce that by 10%. And they were ecstatic. They actually, the plant manager actually threw a pizza party for the staff there. Well, then we connected them up uh, to our systems and we were able to see apples to apples versus the other plants, they were a step function worse. And they said, oh my goodness, you know, we had a pizza party about this and, and we're at 9,000 and everyone else is at 2,000. Well, what we were able to do is seeing that side by side and it was one, it, it, it keyed our engineers into, hey, we've got a problem with this plant and, it, and it's a big problem. But two, we were able to do a process walkthrough and see what they were, what they were not doing actually is for printed circuit board assembly, you've got these reels of parts that get fed into the machines. And as that reel starts to run out, the best practice is to actually splice a new reel onto it so the machine never uh, runs dry of material. Well, they weren't doing that in this plant. So we were able to identify that pretty quickly through one, seeing the data, and then you know two, that, that was zeroing us in on the problem. So we shared that best practice with the plant and overnight they were back, they were you know down on par with the rest of the plants. So you know, th that was one use case. Uh, another of which deals with these, these nozzles. So each one of these machines uh, can have upwards of 100 plus nozzles, uh, which are used to pick the parts off those reels. And they actually do that using suction. So it's almost like picking up a tennis ball with the, the, tube of, uh, the suction tube of your vacuum cleaner. And uh, in, the, in this process, you can see some of the parts that we're actually placing. Uh, this is a match stick here for reference. So some of these parts are actually about the size of a speck of pepper. And when you talk about these nozzles, the performance of those nozzles is critical. Uh, and because they can, because they are so small, they can be jammed by, you know, solder paste that's used in the manufacturing process, or even a speck of dust getting in there uh, could cause serious performance degradation. And that's what this uh, video clip will show here. So this is actually monitoring the nozzles on one of our machines in real time where each one of those bubbles represents a different nozzle on the machine. And it's, it's, we're performing well we're in the, when we're in, in the bottom left there, but as we start drifting to the right, we start seeing a higher percentage of mispicks. And as we start drifting uh, upwards, our overall number of mispicks is increasing. Then these bubbles will actually grow in size as that rate of mispicks is increasing. And what you're seeing here is this one nozzle is the problem child of the group and, and is actually causing 42% of the rejects that we're seeing. So this, this is visualizing the data for us. Now with some of the systems that we have, uh, including uh, PTC ThingWorks, which is our, our newest uh, IoT platform, uh, we're actually able to set alarms. So when we cross some of those thresholds to trigger uh, an alarm to our maintenance people, to our supervisors, to stop this problem before it becomes a big problem. Um, and we can actually write back and interface with the machines um, and, and to, to shut them down or, or to throw an error code, again, before, before seeing a, a major headache occur. Another example of, of data visualization uh, dealing with our printed circuit board assembly um, actually deals with mashing up some of, some of our different data. 
So this is this is showing in the, the black line here is our missed picks trended over time. And you can see between these red lines here, uh, we had a pretty big spike in our number of missed picks. And if you look close at the dates here, this is October through April, which is generally our winter months. And when we layered humidity data on top of this, we could see there was a, a strong correlation there. Well, what was happening, and we observed this on, on our production lines, is those reels of parts have a, a thin layer of plastic that, that, co that covers them and holds the components in place. As they feed into the machine, the plastic peels back to expose the part to the machine. Well, during the winter months, the heat kicks on, our humidity drops, and you probably notice this at home when you're walking across the carpet, you tend to get shocked a little bit more when you, when you go to touch the doorknob than, than you do in the summertime. Well, this was causing uh, more static electricity in the plant. Uh, the, the components were actually sticking to that plastic, and that was causing uh, the machine, when that happens, the machine has to index and present another part, um, which is bad for two reasons. One, uh, that, that original part becomes scrap because you know, as, it fall, it, as it falls off the reel, we don't reuse these components uh, for quality purposes. But two, that indexing was causing slowdowns in the machine. Okay, so we observed a problem, but how big was the problem? We didn't know until we, we peeled back the onion and actually looked at the data. And what this was actually costing us was an 18% efficiency loss on some very high revenue generating production lines. Uh, so, you know, like any of the, any of the other companies represented here on this call, we have to justify our capital projects, our capital expenditures to our senior management and having this data enabled us to do that. So what we were able to do using this data uh, was to justify a project to implement these, these misters in the plant. So when you go into our plant in Twinsburg, we actually have these that are mounted to the ceiling and it's uh, controlled by a control system that's monitoring humidity. And as we drop below a certain threshold, they'll kick on and it's actually like the, the produce section in the grocery store. But that regulates the humidity in the plant. Um, and starting in the, the winter 2018, 2019, it's the first winter we had these and you can see our level of missed picks continued on in steady state as if it were, as if it were the summer. So that 18% that efficiency loss was, was all but eradicated. So going forward where we're at now, uh, we've, we've standard on ThingWorks as our, our IoT platform within Rockwell Automation. And the reason for this is, is because it gives us a number of capabilities. Um, it, enable, it enables us to mash up data from disparate sources. Um, so when we talk about things like MES data, uh, controller data, time and attendance data, uh, unique uh, manufacturing system data. We're able to bring that all together to contextualize it. And we're able to do that fairly easily. Um, I'm, a, I'm a mechanical engineer by degree. I am not a programmer. I do not like programming, but I'm able to, to do the, this mashup of data, to this contextualization of data fairly easy in the system, which was important for us because the, again, you know, when we look at the customers of our data internally, it's engineers, it's quality people, it, it's not IT people. But aside from a visualization platform, ThingWorks is actually more of, is is much more than that. I mentioned it's an IoT system, so in in terms of write back capability, alarms and notification capability, it becomes that platform for us to not only visualize data but to build on for some of those additional capabilities. And and a couple off that, Kurt. I mean, it's a lot like your Apple iPhone in terms of now that you've got this IoT platform. No, Kurt's job now is in terms of what application can I do based on now having a platform. So it's not like you have to go out and develop all these individual apps and they act independently. Now we're using them all together to communicate, to visualize. But um, I'm going to leverage off of a, a slide that uh, or a screen that uh, one of our solution consultants drafted up on here and uh, to describe what ThingWorks can do for, for them. Um, but it also pertains right to here with Rockwell. Uh, it was the ability for ThingWorks to, as Kurt said, is to really interface with a bunch of different products that are out there that we need to gather information. And really when you're attacking a problem, you want to try to get as much resolution, as much information to define what that problem is. And really, if you think about it, that's what ThingWorks kind of does. How does this thing work? 
right? So when I'm going after an application, I may need data from a historian database, or I may need data from an HMI or a sensor. You know, so as we're going into this IIoT and where do I bring all this sensor data? Well, we could individually set it up to the cloud or we can bring it into the ThingWorks platform and actually do our AI if we want to do it or machine learning right there. And But the the, the other unique thing about ThingWorks is, is it gives us that bi-directional communication to now write back to. So if I need to slow down a line or if I need to take an action or cut a work order or anything like that, that's what ThingWorks can go and bring us forward and as we move forward. And again, Kurt's mind is where he's going now is, is what else can I now drop into this ThingWorks application that I currently have in there today to now start leveraging the value of, if it was just a single app, it might not have been the best investment on a single app. But now as this broad case, Kurt, how many apps are we continue, uh, actively looking at now, just about? Dozens, easily. Dozens. Yeah. Yep. I mean, and and, it's and continuing to grow each day. Yep. And then the other part is, is now we're using as our visualization tool in terms of bringing that information so I can historize, uh, I can put up charts, I can put up um, work orders, I can put up things. So you see on the right hand side, but let's go into a couple applications. It's kind of blended in on here. We'll go back to this one on here, but as you can see, one more thing that's on here is that there's a place and things that for each of these different platforms that are out there. You can see where we have thing works that where we identified for us is a need for an IoT platform. Again, to kind of bring all that data into one particular location, but we're going to have other areas where we're going to need, uh, we're developing different apps, but we'll need an area for analytics. But also then we're going to see a need for AR and VR. We're going to talk a little bit about that when it comes to COVID-19 in terms of some of the applications. We're actually, an AR application actually helped us in facilitating us in some of our FATs. So um, just wanted to show that there's an overall uh, kind of a, we call it a rapid extend, the ability to put this platform over existing uh, uh, applications that we currently have today and bringing that information into it. But Kurt, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we did with uh, Chalk in terms of the AR experience, uh, especially due to COVID-19. Yeah, so uh, Euphoria Chalk is, is one of the, the tools that we use in our suite of products. and it enables us to do video chatting but also enables you to do it's almost like watching monday night football with john madden where you're able to draw on the screen and and give visual guidance to somebody uh remotely uh we've with COVID 19 in particular uh in our engineer to order business we build motion control centers where they're basically something the, the size of something that would fit on a flatbed trailer and our, our typical processes as we finish that build, we bring the customer in to do what we call a witness test. We power, we power the device on, we run it through our, the various cycles and, and they're able to see, yes, this is working correctly and, and do the, the, the formal sign off from there. With COVID, I'm, I'm sure as, as folks can relate, we, we want as few people in our plan as possible uh, to, to minimize our risk of exposure. So we've actually started doing these witness tests remotely using Euphoria Chalk, where our customers are able to, from their home locations, conduct the witness test, view and, and see that, that everything's working correctly without having to travel to our plants, without having to enter our plants and, and minimize that risk of exposure for everybody. So that that's that's one of the I, I guess silver lining you, you know outcomes that we've seen with with the ways we've had to adapt in the, the current operating environment. But talking more a little bit about data visualization, I want to go through some of the the live examples that we have in some of our plants. So I'm actually going to show some of the dashboards that were are up in our plants and showing real time data right now. So what I'm showing at this point is a, a kidding work board that we use in our Twinsburg facility. And this is on display in our, our kidding, our, our warehouse area, where our associates are picking the reels of parts to go out to our surface mount lines for building those, those circuit boards that I spoke about. And the, the, the process is, is really four phases. We look at all the work orders that are scheduled, so each one of these cards here represents a, a setup of, of work orders. So we'll run work orders back to back to back in, in setups and then tear down the machine and then run another batch through. Um, from there, the material gets picked um, out, of, out of the warehouse and it gets built up onto, onto the feeders that actually get loaded into the machines. From there, it'll get delivered out to the lines. 
Now what this is doing up at the top, each one of these different colors represents one of the seven lines that we have in Twinsburg. And it's showing us our total buffer time as uh, that we have in front of the machine before it becomes starved of material. And what this does, this orchestrates all the activities in our kitting area. So that way our associates know exactly what setup they need to be building next to keep that, that buffer time in front of the machine so it's not becoming starved of material. You can see this one here, it's, it's fallen to about four hours. That's hit our threshold to where we start showing this visual cue that this is the, the next priority. And you can see we've got a couple of, of materials being picked right now to, to replenish that buffer. Um, the before picture for this, this was done on a whiteboard where associates were moving magnets around to, to articulate this. And our, our team lead in this area was spending 90% of her time sitting at her desk with the printout of the schedule, trying to, to with pen and paper and calculator, trying to figure out what to work on next. And just when she would have it down, the team lead from manufacturing would come over and say, hey, by the way, we had a downtime on, on line one um, that's completely shifted the schedule around, or we actually got ahead on line two. So you know, just as soon as she had it figured out, it would be time to recalculate. So this has enabled team leads to be team leads, to manage their area, to step back in the pocket, so to speak, and have that, that full visual versus having their head down in a, at, at the desk and, and not really being able to see what's going on in their area. Another example of data visualization. So you know, I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with Toyota production system and the concept of hand-on lights. Um, hand-on lights are great. They, they, they alert people when something's going wrong, but this is, this is what I'll consider and on of, of, of our modern time, where uh, this is a use case that we've developed for our plant in Monterey, Mexico, which is about a mil, uh, half million square foot of manufacturing space, where we've got a warehouse on one side of the plant that's supporting all operations in the plant. So as, and with any kitting operation, any, any materials operation, inevitably you're gonna run into the issue where somebody's short parts. Uh, I'm building on one side of the plant and, and kitting forgot to bring me something. Well, instead of turning on an and on light for somebody to walk all the way over and, and ask me what the problem is and then having to go back to the warehouse and bring me the parts, we have this on display as in a TV in that warehouse operation to where our associates in the manufacturing lines can enter into the, through their MES system. Hey, I've got a problem. I'm short part X, Y, Z. This is the quantity. This pops up on the TV in, in the warehouse. And they're able to see exactly who's short, what they're short, and when that problem was logged. So then they can grab the part and bring it directly out there and, and save all the back and forth. So the last use case I want to show is what we call our cell performance display. And we have this displayed on TVs at, at the front of all of our production lines. And this is intended for our manufacturing associates and our first line supervisors. And this, this basically provides us a snapshot of how well that line's performing for the given shift. So we show visuals like our time between units chart, which is showing every time a unit's rolling off the line, it's is generating a data point on this chart. So our constraints here at, at the black line and our actual performance is this blue. So as circuit boards are coming off the line, it's generating data points. And it's like golf where, where spikes are bad. We want lower scores here. So I can see, you know, generally I was having pretty good performance and then I had this big slowdown here. Um, and I can see I, I actually had a material change over there where, where that caused the, the line to slow down. But then I can also see the play-by-play -play here in terms of an hour-by-hour -hour performance. Are we hitting our efficiency goals? If not, why? You know, I can see we had some material tester issues here um, and, and this helps to, to see are we going to have a good day or are we going to have a bad day where as a team leader or a supervisor do i need to focus my attention do i need to get maintenance involved uh, do i need to escalate so that this helps us helps us visualize and contextualize that performance data uh, you know rapidly hey kurt quick question for you where are you yep. today so I'm, I'm working from home today, if, if you can't tell by the backgrounds, and I'm pulling up data I showed from Twinsburg, um, from Mexico. If I wanted to, I could cycle through and, and see any of our 18 connected facilities globally. I could pull up a report from Shanghai or Singapore if I wanted to. How, how much lost time do you think you had because of COVID-19? Any at all? For my role? Yeah. 
I, I'm able to do my role from anywhere in the world. And, and I bring that, yeah, I bring that up, uh, uh, Rick, because I saw you jump back in here. But one of the big issues that we're seeing on here is in terms of people that didn't prepare for COVID-19 and who could and anything on there. But the ability for us to transition into this kind of, um, we're hearing a lot about light out or remote uh, monitoring or remote work type of thing. We didn't experience any of these blips at all because we had the ability to connect into, to visualize what's going on and really focus on the issues that are at hand. So, you know, if anything out of this whole thing in terms of what's what a major take back is, is that visualizing the data and presenting the right information to the right people always gave us that real time visibility in terms of the plants. Otherwise, Kurt would be packing up in COVID-19 and saying, honey, I got to go to the plant. And she goes, well, I'll see you in two weeks then, you know, type of thing. Yeah, yeah. All right, can we, uh, we're off to close up. I guess we've got maybe 30 seconds left. So let's go to the uh, uh, the end of the presentation. Let's talk about the, yeah. So in closing, um, this information should be also included with the link that's given to you later on within about a 24 hour period. I encourage you to take a look at, again, uh, this additional information for um, reading for viewing and also maybe even getting uh, some additional resources to help you in your in your uh, investigation. Um, next slide. And I also want to make sure that uh, you know that the next the next webinar is called Analyze and it's for key performance indicators, and that'll be June 26. So again, get a chance to take a look at that and uh, sign up. And then on behalf of the manufacturers. Oh, and then here's some good contact information for you then too. So if you have any further questions or even some comments about what took place today, you can either call me or you can call David Knowles. All right. With that said. Muted, Jay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, okay, here. here. Um, if you folks want to hang on for a few more minutes, uh, those that are interested in posing questions or hearing the answers to questions, I'm sure we can hang on for a few more minutes. Uh, right. That would be all right with David and Kurt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but again, this is the official, uh, I guess, closure of the webinar. We said we wanted to keep it 45 minutes, but again, good content here today. Really appreciate uh, your contribution to Kurt and Dave. Thank you so much. Uh, but again, if folks want to pose questions or hear answers to questions, um, uh, please just stay on the line. We'll keep the line open uh, to the top of the hour at the latest. Okay, okay. Thanks. thanks so much. All righty. Um, I've, I've had my questions um, monitor open. I don't see any. So I've got a couple, though, that um, would be interesting. Uh, if uh, either Kurt or Dave provided some input. So um, you were talking a little bit about COVID-19, but could you also tell us a little bit more about how AR and VR play a, a role in that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're looking at um, augmented reality is, is, is the ability for us to kind of, once we have the data, you connect the data, but where do you present the data? Many times that people are locked into a screen or a monitor or something that'll be on there that they, you know, I'd have to have a, you know, a device in order to see what's going on there. And what we're seeing on here is what the use of augmented reality is, is that we're able to take some of that data and kind of place it right on the machine. So you see the machine that'll be there and the data that'll be brought right up to there. And that's very helpful from the standpoint is, is that even from a standpoint that's on there, um, I could have that data presented right on the particular machine and see what's happening in real time that's on there. So we're taking the data off a screen and we're actually placing it onto there. We're also using augmented reality, um, as Kurt mentioned, um, with the ability for us to do um, what we call is use a Vuforia chalk, which allows us to kind of reboot and go from connect, like almost like a FaceTime app, as Kurt said too, but I'm allowed to do the annotation. I love the John Madden thing that he mentioned, but it allows us to do the annotation. This is extremely important now because uh, virtually no plants are allowing uh, any type of OEMs to come in to service the equipment. So you have to be the eyes and the ears in order to see what's actually happening in on the plant. So this type of augmented reality allows us to go and then connect up to the plant, see what's going on, make the annotations that'll be on there. 
The other thing that we're seeing too is uh, work order instructions. So allowing, because now if, if Kurt's the expert on there and I'm trying to train somebody on a particular machine in terms of how that works, it's a lot easier. We're seeing a, a much more adopted rate by using augmented reality of creating a work order instruction that the operator now can put on a, a, an AR type of device and kind of walk through and see, you know, it's kind of like taking YouTube to the next step that's on there. But it's now allowing the, the operator to go and see exactly what they need to do, step-by-step -step instructions with the machine physically right there. Excellent, excellent. Um, another question. Uh, talk a little bit more about your CTQ and how the applications of, uh, again, DDM basically automate your continuous improvement process. Kurt. <laughs> well, let's try Kurt. Let's try Kurt. me. So yeah, so it, it it all goes back to you know what what problem are you trying to solve? You, you know we have engineers in our plants and and we're able to see, you know, anecdotally we're having a we're having a problem. You know we we saw it with the misters, we saw it with the nozzles, and that's that's you know there's there's kind of the phrase where you see dirt start you know, that's where people start digging. And that's what we're able to do. You know, we we see a problem, but how big is the problem? Do we know what we need to go after? We don't we don't like just you know taking shots in the dark because again, there's a cost to that. Any of our projects, just like anyone on the call here, we've got to justify to our management. Um, so you know, we we see a problem, we we capture the data to uh, contextualize and, and figure out what the, how big the problem is and and what the appropriate response needs to be. Yeah, it just real quickly, CTQ is critical to quality, right? So again, what we do is we go after the things that are the issues. And Kurt explained before too, as opposed to going that trying to get all data for everything that's on here, start with the areas that where you have these problem trials. And one of the areas of your quality people will say is what's critical quality? What's what what are the things that we need to focus on first that's gonna drive on there? Excellent. All right. How about another one? Here's a question we always get a lot is, uh, can you elaborate on your financial justification for your first data-driven manufacturing project, you know, in terms of expected ROI and payback period? And then what was the actual outcome and how do you justify DDM projects today? Yeah, so so when we talk about this journey, you know, you know it, it wasn't overnight for us. And you really have to sit down and ask yourself, you know, what are the costs for some of these things? You know, when I when I gave when I gave that slide the before and after, you know, how how much uh, paperwork are we chasing? You know, how how many how many times do we have engineers spending that 50% of their time collecting data, being data clerks and not being engineers? Because um, that that's not what we pay engineers to do. We we want them to be processing information and and giving us results and not sitting there with a stopwatch or a clipboard. Um, so those were some of the decisions that, that you know, came into play as, as we started going down on this journey. Um, and and it, as, as we are today, with the, where we're a little bit more mature in this, where we look towards our, our next opportunities, we look at things as, you know, what is the opportunity for productivity savings? You know, are we in a position where there's potential risk for quality, uh, quality issues getting out to our customers? Um, are we advancing in, in the use of our connected enterprise and, and building on platforms that'll help us, you know, move to the next level in the future? You know, these are some of the factors that we consider today when we're when we're looking at capital expenditure or even just effort expenditure, um, be it IT or, or folks on my mm -hmm. team. But but the whole thing about this data-driven manufacturing, Rick, is and, and this is Kirk can't justify we should invest within a particular thing to improve throughput and everything along those lines just by really just saying we think that this is going to happen theories theories don't get funding okay so mm -hmm. the for us to get that visualization of data to really go after that issue as you saw in that one slide it was 18 percent so is that getting to you know the, the pennies in terms of what that meant to us it's not mm -hmm. only was it lost manufacturing time but it, then it's lost sales it, it impacts so many other things in terms of I, it's lost lead times. It's those types of things that are on there. So every product we don't make that we don't sell, that's lost revenue for Rockwell. All right, last question. Um, will the visualization of data being pervasive now throughout the whole organization make you more vulnerable to cybersecurity threats? And what are you doing to mitigate the risk? Well, 
Security is a is the number one issue. I mean, we have the creation of a you know um, a chief information security officer in our organization. So not only protecting the intellectual property that we have in the development of our products and things, we are very um, um, not um, concerned, not concerned, but we're very active with regards to making sure that that whole chain through the connected enterprise, making sure that you saw all those locks that I had on that one slide, making sure that there's no access points with any one of those things that are on there. So. That's one of the big caveats that we see with people going at, with IAOT. You'd be is getting all that data, and the downside is is leaving these doors that could be potentially open. And we look at security all the way through. And and if you look at one of the things in terms of one of even one of our number one investments for that we're doing is not only securing our infrastructure, securing securing our products, physical and password and everything else that we're doing. But yeah. We, this is equally as we're doing and developing this connected enterprise uh, enter that we have within there is a security to make sure it's bolted on top of this thing because we don't want mm -hmm. and you can see the number of companies that have been just hit because of virus attacks or anything like that can absolutely shut down an organization for days or, or, or weeks uh, from that standpoint. So um, don't take it without security. It's, it goes hand in hand. All right. Well, that's where we are right now. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for sticking around the uh, question and answer session. Again, if you have any questions, um, the contact information is in the presentation. You'll be getting in another 24 hours. And uh, we'll look forward to um, interactions with you. And especially if, if you're needing help, trying to figure out what your journey looks like, please give us, either one of us, Dave or myself, a call. And uh, you'll also have access to all the other people who've been presenting and will be presenting each of the five steps of the uh, journey. So again, uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. And I thank you for taking the time out of your day to spend it with us. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.